Hey guys, what is going on? It is me, box 12 here, and welcome back to another Realm of the Mad God Dungeon Guide video. Today we're going to be taking a look at the Woodland Labyrinth. <laughs> Who needs a guide on that? Often abbreviated to Wood Lab, this is the hard mode variant of the Forest Maze Beginner's Dungeon for higher level play. Every time a new realm opens before fighting the Red Demons, the Lucky Ent and Jinns will be your quests. In our case, the Lucky Ent behaves identically to a normal Ent God, but with a larger golden sprite, higher damage, and more HP. He also looks like he's in a constant state of shock. Like most events in Godlands, it's important to prioritize clearing any surrounding enemies that might cause disastrous interference. Upon defeat, it will drop a portal to the last Labyrinth, guaranteed. And because it's always one of the first quests in a fresh realm, you can bet that there will be a lot of people going in here. You can always call it out for players to teleport as well, if someone isn't already popping keys on the Nexus Bridge. Yeah, I get used to seeing that. What I mean by that is, typically speaking, you're going to be in a decent sized group of people when doing this dungeon, which significantly cuts down on how much interaction is required on your part. Nearly every time you're gonna wait at spawn for someone to rush, teleport to boss, someone will probably chain paralyze, you can bring an archer if you want to contribute, and then it dies. Now, if the big plan balancing update goes through, enemies and bosses will have a short period of immunity to status effects after being afflicted, preventing chain paralyze and stun and all that. So the strategy could very well change. You might have to step off to the side, back up, you know, actually engage in combat. But as it is right now, this has been the main wood lab experience. And until those changes take effect, that's how it's gonna stay. So for the sake of actually showing you what this dungeon has going on, I'll be focusing on the solo approach. You don't have to be maxed out, but having at least 50 speed will be a big help in not getting tripped up by a few life-threatening traps. Some enemies can even drop the speed sprout, giving you a 5 second speedy bonus, assisting in both rushing and dodging. But the high HP of certain enemies makes having maxed attack and dexterity highly recommended. In regards to picking melee versus ranged, they both have their strengths. It's a pretty boxed in area, so the higher defense can help a lot with closer ranged encounters. But the boss I felt exclusively benefited from range, if only to clear out minions, but we'll get to that. Necromancer is a good beginner's pick due to the high volume of enemies, letting your skull get a massive heal both in dungeon and at boss. Mystic can stasis everything aside from the cactus. Assassin can be advantageous for throwing poisons over walls and onto enemies that aren't smart enough to simply step to the side. You can even chuck poisons over into the boss room after activation and kill it that way, but please don't. But nothing outclasses the sheer effectiveness of the archer. Being able to pierce through multiple enemies and paralyze every single one of them, if you have good aim and mana regen, you can line them all up exactly where you want them and take them out. Huntresses can also work in this regard if you have a coral trap, and even basic slows can be effective. Also, a little tip, if you have a bard to buff the range of a wand class, you can probably kill the boss without it even seeing you. Like its original counterpart, the dungeon is set up like a maze. Lots of dead ends, many rooms look identical, and you're never quite sure if you're going the right way. The floor is an ever-alternating patch of dark and light green grass grass with clusters of trees scattered throughout, and each room has you surrounded by a dense forest with occasional breaks in the middle that lead you to the next room, but aren't marked on the minimaps, so you have to look for them manually. Also, damage text and sprites don't appear inside this gap, so unless you see shots coming out or hear the sound effect, smaller enemies can be hiding in there and start roughing you up without warning. So it's important to pay attention to your main health bar and back out of there if it starts dropping. Only sometimes will things appear like if you shoot the edges, but let's just say I don't think that's working as intended. There are four main enemy and hazard types to watch out for. Goblins, squirrels, moths, and turrets. Forest Goblin Bruisers are a standard melee enemy that hobbles around looking for love before abruptly charging to your position. I must find wife. Tossing out a single 100 damage whacking stick at a moderate rate. This allows you to easily circle it, but I wouldn't recommend doing that all the time, as the room geometry doesn't fully accommodate it without lunging you into another hazard or drawing aggro from another room. Pulling enemies in front of you while backpedaling is my preferred strategy as it's much safer, but keep in mind that these horny hamlets have very selective aggression. They don't follow your every move and once you get a certain distance away, they return back to their general point of origin, which once again lends itself to a longer ranged style of play. So you don't have to do as much catching up and risk losing them in the draw distance. It is possible to juke the attacks without moving your character much. This keeps you out of harm's way and your eyes stay on the prize, but it doesn't work well with multiple foes or bigger targets. The Necromancers are essentially identical, but with a double shot at longer range, a higher rate of fire, and much less HP, so you just have to be a little faster. Next are the Grizzled Armored Squirrels. These have the high DPS so far with a 270 triple shotgun at 90 damage per shot, and are realistically the most threatening moving targets in my opinion, because they often come in groups. So on average, you're up against anywhere from 6 to 9 bullets at a time, not even including other possible enemy types in the room. Circling them is a no-go, because they're constantly following and unfollowing you, interrupting the rotation. So your best option is to drag them and strafe out of the way. With sufficient healing and armor, of course you can circle or deal with them in any way you want, but for the players who can't, 
it's not a viable option. Following them are the mecha squirrels. It was only just now that I realized that the face is a knight's helmet. I always thought that was just the nose, and that's probably what it is, but now I can't unsee the possibility of a tiny man operating this mechanical rodent from the inside like Jim Carrey in a rhino. Technically speaking, these are the most dangerous enemies, with 175 damage per acorn at a randomly alternating pattern of one, two, or three shots at once. This means a potential 525 damage in an instant. Thankfully, they're pretty slow. You can bait them, and if you stay about eight tiles away, you can destroy them without being detected. Priests and sorcerers won't even have to move, although I'd still recommend taking out any small fry in the room beforehand. Finally, we have the Micro Megamoth Sentinel, my least favorite enemy because you guessed it, they confuse. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! When you get close, they'll home in on you with 80 damage and 0.9 seconds of confusion should you happen to get hit. They're easy to take out one at a time, but when there's a lot of them, you either have to attack from far away where they can't see you, or never stop moving. Lucky for me, they seem to be the least common enemy found, so there's a plus. Now, all of this would be fine, but what throws a wrench in the whole operation are the turrets. I'd say about half of the rooms in the Woodland Labyrinth have these indestructible turrets. There are three types, paralyzing cactus for 1.2 seconds, quieting bushes for four seconds, and weakening withered branches for five seconds at 80, 120, and 100 damage respectively. These turrets are always actively firing in the same pattern, albeit with their own unique timing. There can be up to three in one room, either scattered or concentrated, and they'll always be the same type. They don't mix. The paralyzed cactus have an alternating interval of roughly two in three seconds. In other words, they'll fire once, wait two seconds, fire again, then wait three seconds, and then repeat. However, each turret is independent from one another, so the timing could be different. The intervals are still the same, but there's a high likelihood that they'll be firing at different times, making the period of downtime where nothing is firing much shorter. The quieting bushes are a bit simpler. They have a one, two, three burst, and then a three second cooldown. Sometimes the final round will come out faster than expected. Instead of one, two, three, it'll be one, two, three. I don't know why that is. It could be random, lag, or affected by player distance, but it is a possibility. The weakening branches actually have the same behavior as the bushes, so you really only have to memorize two patterns. The one thing that they all have in common, though, is that if you stand still, they will never fire right at you. They always go around. Yeah, this was kind of surprising when I discovered it for the first time. I was so used to not doing the dungeon and just TPing the boss that I didn't realize how these things worked. So if you keep track of the turret timing while running through a room and you stop in place right before they shoot, you won't get hit. It can be a little hard to get the hang of because I'm pretty sure they lock onto you before firing, so you have to do some extra anticipating, but it can be done. Dodging them at the same time as squirrels and goblins, however, not so easy. This is the reason why circling is often impossible to pull off without a hitch, and why I end up camping by room transitions a lot of the time. It simplifies things. Look around for any blocks of trees nearby, because they can shield you from turrets and enemies and give you more space to work with. It's a huge help. Unfortunately, there will be times where a turret is placed right in front of a room transition, obscuring the bullets and blocking your way, forcing you to either charge headfirst into the next area, where you can easily collide with incoming traffic, or carefully move bit by bit to reveal the following room, without drawing aggro to too many enemies or getting hit by the nearby turret. If the coast is clear, head on in and find a safe place. If not, remember the layout of the previous room so you don't accidentally back up into any of the turrets you've already cleared. Doing a perfect run here is all about knowing turret locations. Once you have that down, you're golden. Worst case scenario, if you don't see any paralyzing turrets in view, you can always try your luck and rush a couple rooms, tanking shots here and there, but that'll be at your own discretion. Once again, I cannot vouch for the archer's effectiveness enough. The quiver keeps enemies at a safe distance, giving you more time to survey the room and form a much better plan of attack. The labyrinth is a pretty dangerous area when it comes to raw damage, but in the moderately sized group that you'll most definitely be in, most of that challenge is negated. When you make it to the boss, I'd recommend crossing over pretty quickly just in case the Megamoth larva decides to to hastily encompass the entrance. It's not a guaranteed instant kill if it sits on you, but it alternates between four and eight shots, each hitting for 135 and blinding for two seconds. The first round won't kill you, but the second one will. Every three rounds, the larva will stop to throw out one tile of larva puke, and I really wish we had a different name for that. It hits for 55 armor piercing damage and behaves exactly like lava. And I know what you're thinking, Yes, it is possible to leave the boss alive and let it continuously spawn more larva lava until it covers the entire floor. I did it once a couple years ago with Pear, and it was a fun experiment. We even nicknamed the blue bean boss as Bradley for a reason I can't remember. Ideally, you want to keep Bradley in the middle so that he doesn't hurl any tiles along the edges, because you'll be needing that space clear for later. The shots are slow enough to let you circle him at a mid-distance without any real risk. Even melees have it pretty easy. When it falls just below half health, it'll transform into the mammoth 
Megamoth, a far more aggressive state of being. Believe it or not, this is actually one of the few bosses in Realm that actually has multiple discernible forms, not just phase changes. You can take a step back before it emerges, but don't be frightened by its more erratic movement. It has a new non-stop quieting shotgun for 125 damage apiece, but this is where you're going to start circling the edge of the room, or as I like to call it, literally beating around the bush. You don't have to hug the wall completely, in fact, I recommend leaving a bit of space on each side of you since the gaps can be a little narrow between the shots. Wait for the moth to make the first move before rotating around. It'll often throw a shotgun at your immediate side, in my case, my left. And sometimes you can squeeze through or walk around, but if you don't think you can make it, don't be afraid to sit still and wait for a moment. This is no ice sphere, it's not just gonna leap onto you and end your career. You can get surprisingly close as long as you don't stick around. Also, I don't know why this is, but I found it a lot less dangerous to circle the room counterclockwise. My instinct is to go clockwise and leave room on my left, but when looking back at the footage, I had a much easier time when it was on the right. Could just be a personal thing, but it's worth trying out for yourself. While you're doing this, the Micro Megamoth army that it comes prepackaged with will always be trailing behind the Mammoth. So as long as you're circling, it never becomes an obstacle until the final phase or if you're a melee. There is another way to fight this form, where you only do half circles around the room to take out the minions and reposition the boss back to the center, where you can make minor adjustments. But I wouldn't recommend this for melee, since you kind of need the extra space for it to work. Regardless, you'll want to clear out or at least weaken as many mini-moths as possible, because when the next phase hits, they no longer follow the mama, so you can easily run into them when circling and get confused right into the boss. As a last resort, you can lure her away from the remaining micro-moths and then run back fast enough to go take them out, and still be far enough away for her not to see you. When that's taken care of, we come face to face with the murderous Megamoth. I used to be terrified of this form, because there used to be a stacked shots glitch that killed countless players. It's since been patched, of course, but there's still a lot to watch out for, namely, the mini Bradleys walking around. While the stacked shots glitch may have been removed, that doesn't change how many of these are stacked normally due to the mere surplus. They each have eight 80 damage bullet rings that fire off every four seconds, but the murderous Mega Mama Mammoth Moth replaces them when they die, so there's not much of a point in killing them unless you have a lot of people, at which point you're in no real danger anyway. Since they're all clumped up, they always leave a substantial gap for you when you're rotating around the room. Meanwhile, the mean multi-mega magic murder mama moth maker is jettisoning her body towards you with a single rapid-fire neon 125 damage bullet that weakens for three seconds, and a series of red crescent moon boomerang shots for the same damage that graciously are rarely in your path. You still have to try not to get hit, of course, adjust your position accordingly depending on where the larvae are and move to an adjacent gap. If you chicken out and leave the room, it is possible to run back inside if you wait for the Bradley bullets to go on cooldown, and run in the opposite direction of the murderous Megamind, because it will go for you. But you can also bait it to leave the room for a moment, get some damage in, and then it retreats back for you to repeat. You don't have a lot of space to dodge incoming attacks due to the nature of a narrow hallway, but it can be a lot safer than rushing back into the lion's den. And once again, for the last time, archers can keep it paralyzed without ever needing to really move. If chaining status effects becomes null by the next update, it's still the most useful one to have, but you'd be wise to keep a slowing quiver on hand as a swap out for when the boss is immune and then keep alternating. It should provide a very similar effect. When it's all said and done, however, the Woodland Labyrinth actually yields some pretty good loot. You get a guaranteed mark and two potions from a pool of vitality, attack, and even life. There's also a handful of mid-tier equipment that can drop from either boss or the mecha squirrels. If you're in need of some better gear, pop a lucky clover if you have one, and you'll probably walk away with an upgrade. We have two white bag UT items this time that, when combined with the potion drops, make this quite a worthwhile dungeon in my opinion. Leaf Bow is a very high damage offensive weapon for bow classes, second only to the Void and Predator bow, and the Wakizashi of Eastern Winds has the longest exposed duration, amplifying the Samurai's group assistance. It might not be great for some, but it's not an endgame dungeon, so the item should be reined in a little bit. Three pieces of the Horticultural Huntress ST set also drop from here. The ring from the Mecha Squirrels, armor from the Mega Moth, and the bow from the Swarm Tree. Yeah. Let's talk about this guy for a minute. In every wood lab, you'll come across an open wall with a really long transition taking you to a secret treasure room. In the middle, you'll find the swarm tree sitting there and it won't activate until it takes damage. When it does, it'll quickly begin spawning our old friends, the Micro Megamoth Sentinels. Why? They're gonna be up to eight at a time and they won't stop coming back until the tree is dead, so there's almost not even a point in trying to clear them out. Ranged classes have the advantage of circling out of the moth's range, but melees would almost be better off tanking some of the shots to focus on gunning down the tree faster. When it dies, it'll drop eight mini larvas, and those you'll want to clear out since they're guarding your bag. The contents are identical to the Mega Moth when it comes to potions and whites, and seeing as how this tea room is guaranteed, there's really no excuse to not go looking for one. Also, I've never seen this happen but apparently there's a rare chance that the 
tree will turn evil after enough time has passed, gaining blue leaves and four red eyes. It'll then become invulnerable for a few seconds before spawning anywhere from one to three mecha squirrels. That's a cool easter egg. According to Realm Eye, the sprite for the swarm tree is a reused asset originating from the Jade and Garnet statue set piece, and the evil tree sprite was originally meant to be the event boss that would drop the mountain temple, before the statues eventually took that role. I don't know about you, but I love learning trivia like that. I find it really interesting. But that's all there is to it, man. The Woodland Labyrinth can be a little scary your first go around, but once you know its inner workings and stand your ground in a couple, you'll be fine. Thank you guys so much for watching, and as always, don't forget to check out the next episode whenever I post it, which will probably be soon. Alright. See ya.